Hello and welcome to Horizontal Construction. In this segment we're going to be talking about earthwork operations and equipment. We're going to go through some calculations for volume and for area before moving on to the earthwork volume calculation sheet and the mass diagram. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Every construction project is unique. Even when the contractor is experienced and considered an expert in their particular field, they will plan what needs to be done. This, in fact, is what makes them successful and makes them be considered an expert in the first place. They take nothing for granted. Whether they're a plumber, electrician, carpenter, mason, or any other one of the traits that make up this industry, planning is critical and the successful traits and the successful contractors plan accordingly. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. That was a true Mike Tyson quote. And though it may be true in boxing, it's also true in construction. But every great plan will have a backup plan because no two projects will ever be exactly identical. Costs change labor changes, site conditions change, and to use Mike Tyson's analogy, we should be prepared in case we get to the job site and get punched in the face. A good plan is going to allow you to understand the project requirements, define the work elements, define safe construction processes, improve efficiency at the site, and integrate systems and schedules to maximize the profit of the project. And now look at this poor fella. This proves that even if you were born to do a job, it does not necessarily mean that you're going to be doing it safely. Remember, no matter how many times you've done a job before, be sure to think the whole project through. And even when you feel that you have thought the whole project through, think it again. There are what many refer to as the basic steps of any construction project planning process. Those steps include, in order, reviewing all of the contract documents. Be sure that you have obtained all of the documents as well as all of the addenda. A key in this step is to be sure that you have all the documents in their entirety as any given task of the project can impact another. Next, study the plans. The plans give a strong indication of the site conditions and various obstacles that may be encountered. The next step, plan your processes. Again, no two sites are exactly the same. Conditions change, weather changes, labor changes, and all of these are going to impact your work plan. Next, perform the quantity takeoffs. Understanding how much material is to be hauled in or hauled out in horizontal construction is not just the key to success, it is success. We'll talk about this in a few moments. And lastly, estimate your costs. Horizontal construction is usually earthwork construction, and this means that the costs are going to be per unit. The contract documents are the basis for every bid submitted. Anyone who wants to prepare a complete and accurate bid proposal must become familiar with the documents. The documents can consist of many sections, but some of the basics are the following. The invitation to bid. Here, potential contractors are invited to bid on the project and are typically provided a brief summary of the project. Next is the instruction to bidders. To submit a complete bid and be considered for the project, contractors must follow the instructions which have been provided. Next is the bid form. All contractors must use the provided bid form when submitting their bids. Next is the owner contractor agreement. This is the basic contract. It essentially formalizes the agreement between the owner and the contractor. Next is the general conditions. 
In this section of the contract, the relationship, responsibilities, and rights of all project participants are defined. The general conditions are followed by the supplementary conditions, often referred to as the special conditions. This section of the contract is used to amend or supplement portions of the general conditions, because all conditions vary. Next is the technical specifications. The technical specifications are the written word of the project. Following this section is the working drawings. These are the actual illustrations of the project showing exactly how various items are to be built. And lastly, addenda. Addenda can be drawings or technical information that modifies the contract documents after they have been issued to bidders but before any bids have been taken. Unlike vertical construction where a plan is put into place and can, in most cases, be executed, horizontal construction is different. Here, engineers are constantly getting feedback on possible site condition changes as the project progresses. Items such as the volume of stripping, whether or not we're excavating rock, embankment materials, waste, or soil excavation have to all be considered as the project continues. This is what's known as the quantity survey or quantity takeoff. During this time, the planner must make certain decisions, such as equipment needs, the sequence of operation, and the crew size. In the old days, it was fairly easy to know that you've taken on too much work. But today, things are different. So let's go through some horizontal construction planning from the beginning. So let's start by talking about presenting horizontal construction. In horizontal construction, distances are measured in what is referred to as stations. Stations are merely locations along the horizontal distance and are based on the 100 numbering system. This means that two distances adjacent to each other, or two stations adjacent to each other, would be 100 feet apart. The first station may be listed as 1 plus 0, 0, and the second station would be marked as 2 plus 0, 0. The term stations is what a surveyor uses when denotating in their book for laying out horizontal construction. Now, horizontal construction is typically presented in three different views. There's the plan view, the profile view, and the cross-section view. The plan view looks down on the project. This view shows the center line of the project as well as the project limits. The project limits are shown as the dark exterior lines in the drawing. The profile view is a cut view along the center line of the project. The center line stationing is along the bottom horizontal scale. The vertical scale shows the elevations. The dashed line in this view is the existing ground elevations, while the solid line is the proposed finished grade. This is a cross-section view of the project. The left side of this slide shows a cross-section as a fill, while the right side of the slide shows the cross-section for a cut. The cross-section view is formed by a plane cutting the project vertically and at right angles to the longer axis of the project. The continuous line shows the final grade of the work, and the dashed line shows the existing ground elevations. Now that we've reviewed some various horizontal construction views, we must literally dig into the calculations. When doing earthwork calculations, they are usually done in volumes. It involves the balancing of cuts in the roadway and fills in the roadway, and finally identifying the most economical haul routes for your materials. Earthwork is usually defined by various areas. They may be the area of a circle, the area of a square, or the area of a rectangle. These are the more simple areas to calculate. To calculate the area of a circle, it is pi r squared. Pi is 
a constant. It is the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. It is typically replaced by the Greek symbol pi and is often approximated as 3.14, sometimes approximated as 3.14159, but it is much longer than that. We also have the area of a square, which is any side of the square squared, and then the area of a rectangle, which is length times the width. Now again, earthwork also includes volumes. Therefore, to calculate any of these as a volume, we would calculate the volume of a cylinder as pi r squared times the height of the actual cylinder. The volume of the square would be any side of the square squared multiplied by the depth, while the depth of a rectangle, or the volume of a rectangle, is length times width times the depth. When computing a cross-sectional area, contractors will take into consideration the time that they have available as well as their own planning tools. However, most larger companies will use commercial software packages to perform these calculations. However, such software tools may not be available and therefore many people will subdivide these areas into various geometric shapes. These geometric figures can be calculated with formulas for areas not only for rectangles and squares, but also for triangles, trapezoids, stars, octagons, and other geometric shapes. Now, when calculations must be made by hand, a triangle or a trapezoid area can be computed by using these equations. So if we had these dimensions for a triangle, that it's 4 feet at the bottom and has a height of 2 feet, we could quickly calculate the area as 4 square feet. Or let's assume we had a trapezoid, and this trapezoid was 6 feet wide at the bottom, 2 feet wide at the top, and had a height of 4 feet. Well again, using our equation, the width at the top plus the width at the bottom divided by 2 times the height of the trapezoid should give us a result of 16 square feet for the area of this trapezoid. So now, how good is your algebra? Let's assume that we have an area of 10.5 square feet. The width at the bottom of the trapezoid is 2 feet and the height of the trapezoid is 3 feet. What is the width at the top of this trapezoid? So again, let's just quickly review the equation. And the equation is the area of a trapezoid equals the width at the top plus the width at the bottom divided by 2 times the height of the trapezoid. But here we have the area of the trapezoid, and that's 10.5 square feet. So we're trying to solve for the width at the top. So it's going to be the width at the top plus 2 divided by 2 times the height, which is 3 feet. If we move the 3 feet to the other side of the equation, we're going to have 10.5 square feet divided by 3 feet. It's going to equal the width at the top plus the 2 feet, the width at the bottom, divided by 2. And if we move the divided by 2 to the other side of the equation, we're going to have 7 feet equals the width at the top plus 2 feet. So in this case, the width at the top would in fact be 5 feet. And once again, these are area and volume equations, but do not include length. So what in fact if we were digging a trench? Well, in situations such as this, where you need to calculate the volume, the average end area method is commonly used. This method determines the volume of material bounded between two cross sections or two end areas. The principle is that the volume of material which is between two parallel or nearly parallel cross sections is equal to the average of the two end areas times the distance between those cross sections along the center line. But care must be taken because it assumes that the ground between the two end areas changes in a linear fashion. And here is the equation. It is area 1 
plus area 2 divided by 2 times the length divided by 27. The 27 is a constant. It is the amount of cubic feet in a cubic yard. So based on the information that you've received and the equations that we've covered, could you calculate the amount of material between these two endpoints? So here we have two endpoints which are in the shape of a trapezoid and the first thing that we have to do is calculate our average end area. So we have to calculate the average area of A1 and then of A2. So the average end area of A1 again is in the shape of a trapezoid. The width at the top is 5 feet, width at the bottom is 2 feet, and the height of the trapezoid is 3 feet. So therefore, we should get an average end area of 10 square feet. At the other end of the trench, we have area A2. This trapezoid has a width at the top of 4 feet, width at the bottom of 2 feet, and a height of 2 feet. And therefore, we should get an average end area of 6 square feet. So if we take the 10.5 plus the 6, it gives us 16.5 square feet. And if we divide that by 2, we should have 8.25 square feet. We want to multiply this by the distance between the two areas, which the diagram shows us to be 100 feet or 825. And then we want to divide this by 27, the amount of cubic feet in a cubic yard. And you should come up to approximately 30.6 cubic yards of material that needs to be excavated. But in that example, we were given the distance in between the two points. Going back to our previous discussion on stations, can you calculate the distance between these two station points? Well, here the distance is pretty simple. It is 51 feet. 1 plus 0, 0 is the 100 foot mark, and 1 plus 51 is the 151 foot mark. The distance between the two is obviously 51 feet. However, what about the distances between these two stations? So here one station is 105 plus 27 and the other station is 110 plus 41. What is the distance between these two? Well, I hope you came up to 514 feet. The distance between station 105 and 110 is 500 feet plus the 27 on the 105 and the 41 on the 110 equals 514 feet being the distance between these two stations. So now let's put all of this information together in what is called the mass diagram. And what the mass diagram does is allows us to fill in the low spots, cut away the high spots, in the most efficient manner possible. So let's start by taking a look at just one section of what a mass diagram worksheet would look like. Now here we have some station locations along a given proposed project line as well as some average end areas. Let's do the calculations for net cubic yards based on these numbers. So if we take a look at the stations along the left-hand side, we have station 1, and the average end area for that location is 267 square feet. The average end area of station 2, or in this case station 1 plus 50, is 1,081 square feet. The distance between the two stations is 50 feet based on the station's 100 numbering system. So now let's stick to our calculation and again the calculation is going to be A1 or average end area 1 plus average end area number 2 divided by 2 times the distance over 27 and once again the 27 is simply coming from the number of cubic feet in a cubic yard. We should come up to 1,248.1 cubic yards. So now let's assume that we are going to continue on with our project here and now we have to excavate between station 1 plus 50 
and station 2 plus 50. Well, at station 1 plus 50, we have an average end area of 1,081 square feet. And at station 2 plus 50, we have an average end area of 1,986 square feet. Therefore, the distance between the two stations, 1 plus 50 and 2 plus 50, is 100. And if we follow the calculation, we're going to take the 1,081 plus the 1,986. Again, this is average end area 1 and average end area number 2. We should get 3,067, which is going to be divided by 2 to give us a number of 1,533.5 times 100, the distance between the two stations, divided by 27, gives us 5,679.6 cubic yards of material that needs to be removed between these two stations. So now I hope at this point you can see how this works and we should just continue right on down the chart. And when we total all of our numbers, we're going to know that we need to excavate 74,457.4 cubic yards of material on the proposed project line. Now the mass diagram is not only an excellent graphical presentation of the earthwork operations, but it's also going to show us how to save money especially on haul distances as well as cut and fill operations. The mass diagram is going to assist the contractor in identifying where specific types of equipment may be needed, haul distances and the grades, where material must be removed and also where material must be replaced. Now to understand this better we must understand the differences in net volume states. In other words, the state of condition. There is bank cubic yards. Bank cubic yards is the volume of material in site. In other words, in its natural volume of material while in its natural state. There's also loose cubic yards. Loose cubic yard volume is what the material would be while it is being hauled. And then there is compacted cubic yards. Compacted cubic yards is the volume of material when compacted. Understanding this terminology is important as it will affect our mass diagram. A general rule of thumb is that compacted cubic yards divided by 0 0.9 will equal the bank cubic yards. So now let's take a look at the entire earthwork calculation worksheet and address some other terminology before moving on. What we see here would be the calculation sheet for earthwork volumes. But before we get into the actual details of this sheet, we must first look at some other terminology involved in doing these calculations. In many cases, the upper layer of material that's going to be excavated cannot be reused at that particular location. In other words, that upper layer might be asphalt, which is going to be reused elsewhere, perhaps as recycled asphalt products, or it might be topsoil, which has to be separated out. As an example, topsoil cannot be used for embankment and is usually handled as a separate excavation. In many cases, topsoil is stockpiled for later use on the project to enhance vegetation and shrubbery growth. In some cases, all of the topsoil must be stockpiled for later use. When we calculate the volume of cut sections, the stripping quantity must be subtracted from the net volume cubic yards. And let me repeat that. The stripping material must be subtracted from the net volume cubic yards. Again, because it is not going to be available as fill material. So what does this mean? It means that in the case of fill sections, sections of the project where fill needs to go in, the stripped quantities must be added to the calculated fill volumes. Sound confusing? Let's go ahead and take a look at the actual calculated worksheet and we'll go through it step by step. 
So here is the actual Earthwork data sheet and column 1 is simply a listing of all of the stations at which cross-section areas have been recorded. As you can see, station 0 plus 00 is the first station. 0 plus 50 is the second station, which is obviously 50 feet away from the first station. Station 1 plus 00, 00 is the third station. It's 50 feet away from station 2 and 100 feet away from station 1. Column number 2 is a cross-sectional end area of each cut at that particular station. This area is usually computed as we did just moments ago. Column 3 is also the average end area of the fill sections at that particular area or the station. This too is calculated, but it is worth noting that there can be a cut and a fill at the same station. This is going to occur where there may be a rise and then a steep drop-off in the elevations. Column 4 is the volume of cut between the two stations. It is important to note that this is bank cubic yards. So where are these numbers coming from? Well, let's go back to column number 2, which is the end area of cut volumes. And if we look at station 2 plus 0, 0, the average end area there is 0. However, the average end area at 2 plus 50 is 64. So if we take the 0 plus 64 and divide it by 2, we wind up with 32. And again, if we just go back to our calculation, average end area 1 is going to be 0. Average end area number 2 is 64 divided by 2 multiplied by the distance, which is 50 feet, divided by 27. We should wind up with the 59 cubic yards that is in this column. So 59 cubic yards will be cut between station 2 plus 0, 0 and station 2 plus 50. Next is column 5, which is the volume of fill between the two previous stations. This is coming from column 3. And again, if we do a calculation, station 0 plus 0, 0 had an average end area of 0, while station 0 plus 50 had an average end area of 115 square feet. So if we take these two numbers, divide them by 2, we wind up at 57.5 square feet. We're going to multiply this by the distance between the two stations, which was 50 feet, divide this by 27, and we should get a result of 106 cubic yards of material at this particular location. And again, we have to note here that these are going to be compacted cubic yards. Compacted cubic yards. Next is column 6, and column 6 is going to bring us back to the discussion on stripping, and it is an important discussion. This is the volume of stripped material which must be removed. This column is commonly calculated by multiplying the distance between the two stations or fractions of the stations by the width of the cut. This provides the area of the cut footprint. The footprint area is then multiplied by an average depth of topsoil to derive at the stripping volume. The average depth of topsoil can only be determined by field investigation. Column 7 is similar to column 6, but this is the stripping volume of topsoil under the fill as opposed to under the cut, and it is determined and measured the same way. Column 8 is the total volume of cut material which is available for use in the embankment. It is given to us by taking column 4 and subtracting from column 6. Column 4 is the amount of cut, while column 6 is the stripping material. 
Once again, we have to deduct the stripping material when excavating. So if we take a look at station 2 plus 50 for the volume of cut from the column 4, this is 59 bank cubic yards. And since there is no stripping at that particular station, the result here at station 2 plus 50 is going to be 59 cubic yards of material is available. But if we take a look at the next item down, it says 144 cubic yards. And if we take a look at column 4, it's 170 cubic yards of material was excavated, but 26 cubic yards was actually stripping material, which gives us the 144 cubic yards of material which is available at that station. Column 9 is the total volume of fill which is going to be required in between two adjacent stations. So again, this is going to be compacted cubic yards, and if we take a look at the first item, it says 124 compacted cubic yards are required. This number is coming from totaling column 5 and column 7. Column 5 is the volume of fill which is required, while column 7 is the amount of stripped material which is going to be required in between these two adjacent stations. So the 106 plus the 118 gives us 124 compacted cubic yards of material will be required between the two stations. And now column 10. You may remember that we stated earlier the relationship between compacted cubic yards and bank cubic yards is simply taking the compacted cubic yards, and again, this is a rule of thumb, and dividing it by 0 0.9. So here, column 10 is simply column 9 divided by 0 0.9. This is telling us the amount of bank cubic yards which must be excavated because that is the amount of material which is required at these two adjacent stations. Up next is column 11. Column 11 is the difference between column 10 and column 8. It indicates the volume of material that is available after balancing the cut and the fill at each adjacent station. Remember, cut is going to be a positive because it's available material, while fill is going to be a negative because it is not available material. Therefore, the minus 138 at station 2, or station 0 plus 50, of 138 bank cubic yards is stating that 138 bank cubic yards are required at the two adjacent stations. And when we compact them, we will have 124 cubic yards, which, as you can see, is column 9, and again, is the required compacted cubic yards between the two adjacent stations. And our final column is column 12. Column 12 is the mass ordinate. It is the running total of all the values which are coming from column 11. So at the third station down, which is station 1 plus 0, 0 we have minus 405 cubic yards. This number is coming from the minus 138, which is at station 0 plus 50, plus the minus 267 cubic yards at station 1 plus 0, 0. And then we just simply continue down the chart adding these totals. And this is how we would begin to set up our mass diagram. Our horizontal scale, or our X scale, would be the actual stations, while the Y scale would be the number of cubic yards required between the two adjacent stations. Therefore, if we refer back to our earthwork volume calculation sheet, we needed 138 cubic yards of material at station 0 plus 50. So therefore, we want to just go ahead and plot that on our mass diagram. 
In the end, we should have a running total that looks similar to this. This is the mass diagram, a running total of the quantities of material that is surplus or deficient along the project profile. An excavation operation produces an ascending mass diagram curve. The excavation quantity exceeds the embankment quantity requirements. Excavation is occurring between stations A and B and stations D and E. The total volume of excavation between points A and B is obtained by projecting horizontally to the vertical axis on the mass diagram line points at stations A and B and then reading the difference between the two volumes. Now if the operation is a fill situation, there is a deficiency of material and a descending curve is going to be generated. Here the embankment requirements exceed the excavation quantities being produced. Fill operations are occurring between stations B and D. The volume of fill can be determined in a manner similar to the excavation operation. The maximum or minimum points on the mass diagram where the curve transitions from rising to falling or falling to rising indicates a change from an excavation to a fill operation, or vice versa. These points are referred to as transition points. On the ground profile, the grade line is crossing the ground line. When the mass diagram curve crosses the datum or zero volume line, as it does at station C, exactly as much material is being excavated between stations A and C as is required for fill between stations B and C. There is no excess or deficiency of material at that point in the project. The final position of the mass diagram curve above or below the datum line indicates whether the project has surplus material that must be hauled out or if there is a deficiency which must be made up by borrowing material from outside of the project limits. And if we look at station E, it indicates a waste situation. There will be excess material on this project that must be removed. And, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to conclude Horizontal Construction Planning Earthwork Operations.